If we are here in Glasgow and you've been soaking up a bit of the atmosphere now to choose our future, to choose what sort of world we want to live in, can you highlight what those choices look like from your sort of expert background? Yeah, I, I think the overall choices that you can make are to continue down this line of trying to manage a way out of things, to not really address any of the social issues that are actually going wrong in society, uh, to not really address the poverty, uh, the inequality, um, the issues that people face in life, yeah. um, and to just continue to sort of paper over the, the sort of cracks in what's called a sort of a pro progress trap that we try and invent our way out of uh, the problem uh, and by doing so create even more problems in the future. So a really good example of this is the uh, Green the Revolution, for example. You know, we uh, had a large explosion of, in, in growth, um, but we then ended up with really large issues with nutrient cycles, using lots of fertilizers, really destroying lots of the uh, ocean environment, uh, really in, uh, destroying a lot of the, the, the aquatic environment. And we could quite easily go down that same road. And when we're talking about some of the technologies that we might be needing in the second half of the century, then again, you're getting into that idea of the progress trap, this idea that we'll just innovate our way out of it. So the choice is really between, do we restructure the economy in the way that everybody is talking about? Uh, do we actually commit to it, do the hard thing with the actual social change, which a lot of times is harder than the technical change? Or do we continue to commit to ever more uncertain and scarier technologies in the future, relying on, on them uh, and then perhaps even managing the actual albedo of the planet itself in, in, in geoengineering and in, in putting in uh, sulfate, solar radiation management, these sorts of things. Okay, yeah. And these conversations, especially around technology, are, are very prevalent here and it seems to be embedded in every scenario. So leading on from that, I mean, there is anger in the streets in Glasgow it's very hard to miss and messages coming straight from the press office of the UK presidency which I've just received saying that you know we're keeping 1.5 alive and what's your perspective on the disparity of views between many outside and the bad people inside it's somewhat what you would expect I suppose in a system where the nuance of the situation where the impact of the situation aren't being felt by the decision makers in the room, there's a lot of talk about how uh, people aren't having their voices heard, they're actually impacted by climate uh, impacts uh, every day, even though those climate impacts are spreading all the way around the world. Uh, the people who are this, many of the decision makers aren't actually impacted by that. Uh, Boris Johnson goes and has a flight to, to meet uh, uh, friends for dinner after, the, uh, after his uh, speech at the COP. So um, to some extent, um, it is sort of um, a property of the UK government and the leadership, I think, of the UK government uh, in actually running the COP itself and looking for those big, glitzy uh, pledges and targets and not actually talking about or even thinking about what it means to have other countries on board. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you highlight the, the British government is obviously the host, so it's quite, and we are, we are sort of confronted by them on a regular basis. Is the fact that they, they rely so heavily on PR to, to put out this stuff, it seems to be angering people more. And do you think that, that anger, I mean, that anger itself is, is kind of, it's becoming the timbre of the, of the protest movement. Um, and I wonder where that, where that leads us. I mean, I, I hope so. I hope it is. Um, it's hard. I always find it's really hard to get that helicopter view of what people are actually thinking until you get sort of polling done and start talking to people more broadly outside uh, the sort of groups that we talk in. It's really hard to know how far that's spreading and sort of that anger. I think there's a bubbling uncertainty amongst lots of people. I mean, the polling shows that in terms of the eco-anxiety uh, going up, uh, people rating climate change as one of the things that they could be concerned about most. And eventually that will flip into an anger across a broader spectrum of society, not just the sort of uh, activism that we're, 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 more, we're used to. Yeah, I suppose that's the social tipping point, the yeah. sort of we, we angling for really. Yeah, and, and on the social tipping point, you know, um, research suggests that um, a minority view can become the majority with about, uh, between about 10 to 40 percent, depending on the issue. Um, and it could even be much lower than that if you get lots of actors in mind. There's this uh, sort of quite slightly controversial discussion of Chenoweth's work on, uh, on uh, uh, the violence and on uh, activism, finding a rule of thumb about 3.5 percent of people. 
Um, but what's for sure, wherever that limit is, it's lower than most people think. I mean, most people think, oh, well, the world's never going to change. And then suddenly it changed very quickly. And even the ones with the higher thresholds, that is a tipping point and it flips quite quickly. So you get above somewhere between 10 and 40 percent and it flips very quickly. The, the medium for that was about uh, 25 percent in that paper, for example. So do you think um, when we look at the, the the building of the momentum here, that it, we are actually seeing we are in that period of change that perhaps now, I mean, I think there has been polling in the UK that 80% of people are very concerned about climate. Yeah. And on the streets, it's manifest in this, um, it's coming together. There was a march in London at the same time as the one here in Glasgow. So maybe that kind of low figure, that low tipping point figure you're talking about could be, could be near. And uh, maybe we need to see that push uh, to, yeah. to sustain. Firstly, it's the most exciting thing that we've seen in years, I think. It's very much activism and uh, challenging uh, existing vested interests that's going to do the job. I mean, academics for a long time are talking about lock-in of industries, and we can expect that those industries are going to take a long time to go. And some of the things that are most embedded in society and the foundations of society, like the subsidies, uh, like some of the social connections, like the banks being able to understand that they need to go through a, a finance and energy transition and understand what that looks like, uh, will be the last things to change. But in order to push all of that, it all comes from that activism. Um, I think the other thing is that I do get asked a lot, well, this is the flavor of the month, climate. Oh, this is a big thing, you know, and oh, people will forget about it, you know, we'll move on to the next big thing. And I say, no, you're not getting it. It, it will be, it won't let people move away from it. It won't let people forget. It won't let people's distraction move away from it because it will just get worse. And even as we get down, hopefully to that near zero, we're still looking at several decades of real difficulty, real harm, real suffering, no matter what we do. Um, and that is going to, we're going to get in this cycle. Every year when the summer comes around, when we get into the Southern Hemisphere, which is where a lot of people live, uh, it starts getting hit by these climate impacts. You get more and more concern, more and more fear, more and more anger. And it's a question then of, yeah, how do you challenge that? Uh, how do you channel that? You know, how do you work with that in, in a productive way? I think Extinction Rebellion does fantastic work. Um, I think it's learning a lot all the time, but that's for the social scientists to, uh, <laughs> to comment on more. But is it, it's interesting because I think as well, we're all starting to have a fingerprint of climate impact somewhere in our lives. Yeah. And the more that happens, I, I think, the more it's going to obviously influence us but you just talked about the next few decades and there's a there's a sense that you know, it's always a horrible thought that it's kind of like humanity has to pass through that eye of the need yeah and on hopefully on the other side we don't know what that looks like but hopefully we, we, we get somewhere better yeah, yeah i mean that, that's it. passing through the eye of the needle is a really great expression to talk about because it's somewhat unfortunate that it has come at this time in the development of humans. I mean, we most of the areas of the world are now shrinking in population. Uh, overall, we're still growing slightly, but it's now shrinking in population. We're starting to understand more about ourselves, more about the inequalities in society. I mean, if we had long enough, I actually have no doubts that we would actually move to this hopeful future, but we really don't have the time for it. Um, and. So getting through these next few decades of both the extra climate harm uh, and also providing um, providing food uh, and energy and water for people is, is it's just going to be crucial and very, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, if I'm in a bar somewhere and I tell people, well, tell people, I, I sort of express my thoughts on where we should be going, what we should be doing, I immediately just almost get labelled, well, I do get labelled an idealist. Yeah. But when you actually look at all this stuff, it's yeah. these ideas that yeah. seem to be the only way out of it. So we study ways in which we can fit everything on the, on the planet. So we look at uh, what happens when you produce something, how does that move through the supply chain and how does that get consumed? And what are the impacts on carbon emissions, on biodiversity upstream on that? And when you look at the data and when you look at them, how to, how to actually make things fit, you start to sound very yeah, radical, very, um, very extreme uh, about how that looks um, and I think it's incumbent upon us to also talk about yes that might look extreme yes that might look radical but actually it's a hell of a lot better than the world that we're currently in yeah, um, yeah. It, and yeah you get labeled an idealist but, but that's that's simply how the how the model shake out <laughs> okay
in your book, um, The Best of Times and The Worst of Times, you prevent an unvarnished truth of what climate catastrophe might look like, but also these radical actions which you just touched upon. Can you talk about how the book itself is structured to deal with the, the kind of, you know, the, the problem and the this proposed solution? Yeah, so um, I was reading a lot of popular science books and you read about 80 to 90 percent of them and it's really bleak uh, and then you get the last 10 to 20 percent that goes oh but we have some of these technologies or we have some of these solutions you're never quite sure how they fit and you're never quite sure you know what's the science saying about that like how does that, that how does that impact other systems that we're also struggling with so in the book i really wanted to commit to what does that pessimistic future look like and what does that hopeful future look like and not in the um, very extreme uh, warming scenarios. So not to, there's a lot of discussion about RCP 8.5. You don't need to get there to be looking at serious civilizational uh, issues and, and potential collapse. Um, but just how systems are changing on the ground. How, how is the climate system uh, responding to the emissions that we've already put in the atmosphere? And how, what do we think would happen even in the medium, uh, the short to medium term? Um, and so in the pessimistic chapters, I really sort of outline what that, that looks like. In the hopeful chapters, I really talk about the amazing things that we do actually have available to us. We have 70% of the technologies uh, we need are already economically uh, competitive to decarbonize uh, the uh, economy. And the last 30% will get really cheap as long as we start investing in them uh, today. I mean, so to give you an example, the Germans spend lots of money on feed-in tariffs. Uh, they brought the price of solar down for everybody very, very quickly because these are granular technologies, very, very exciting uh, technologies that we can use. And of course, we've got all the behavioral changes that we can use. I mean, even just going to plant-based diets, just dramatic impacts uh, upstream uh, in the uh, supply chain on uh, carbon emissions. And so, you know, in those hopeful chapters, I just sort of talk about, okay, you know, that pessimistic chapter is, is sort of business as usual, it's, it's how we're going on today. Um, but if we do change, look at how wonderful that, that world looks like. You're not pumping air pollution into your brain every day, walking through uh, the city streets. Uh, you know, you're eating, you've got access to healthier diets, you've got more access to nature, which we know is so, every meta-analysis out there just shows you how beneficial being in nature is for two hours a week. And I think even, I mean, I forget that sometimes, you know, you get so busy and you're like, actually, I need to get out into, into nature. So um, it's about talking how bad it looks, but also getting that emissions, that gap, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a visualization gap. You know, we yeah. talk about the emissions gap about where we need to go and how much we're emitting. Uh, but it's also that visualization gap about, you know, yes, this is where we're going and it's very scary. Um, uh, but this is how, how hopeful it could be if we did the things that actually we know we need to do. Okay. And it's interesting that you, you talk about confronting the pessimism in a way and, and trying to describe what that might look like. And in the general discourse and you know maybe on twitter or in you know, talking to um, scientists we kind of there's a, almost a taboo around talking about how bad things can do or be or the uh, the dangers that we face what's your take on that yeah my, my sense is that there's a lot of discussion about whether fear or hope works in communication and my reading of the literature on this doesn't seem to suggest that there's any right way to do it, it depends on your audience. Uh, some things can be uh, disempowering, uh, disactivating, uh, some things can be uh, just blithe and sort of optimistic and doesn't really get across any of the actions that need to be taken. So my attitude generally is that we need both. We need to be very as careful as we possibly can be in talking about the realities of that. So not, not going so in the book, I don't go into sort of uh, conflict between states, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as, as a, a certainty due to climate collapse or anything. I talk about, yes, this is something that could happen um, because of crop yield reductions, because of water uh, over abstraction uh, and, and changes of precipitation due to climate change. Um, but I don't say, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's apocalyptic. I think it's very, a lot of people are concerned about the sort of framing of, of fear. I say, well, it's easy to be apocalyptic. Well, actually, you know, if you're going to do it justice and actually explore what that fearful future could look like, you actually have to really get to grips with the science and what that tells you, even it under sort of more optimistic scenarios. And some of the lower uh, warming trajectories do see a very hard time in the next few decades. And I think it's incumbent upon 
us as communicators to communicate how that looks for areas of the world that may not have, 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 have faced a sort of existential threat to their communities. Um, so it's not an existential threat to, to humans, but it's an existential threat to communities, some, some of which have already been wiped off the map around the world uh, due to climate changes. So I think it's our responsibility to be careful about the science, but also describe very well what that fear looks like. And not leave it at that, then also talk about what the solutions and the hope are. Yeah, okay, interesting. What's your take on averting the worst of climate in terms of what happens and especially uh, the conversation around overshoot, which for me is quite dire, but you know, I'd be interested in your take on that. I'm conflicted on this because it's very difficult to get any of the models to square the circle of uh, 1.5 degrees without some sort of overshoot, um, uh, even to a limited amount. And to some extent, I do think we are quite remarkable. So, you know, going back to our discussion before about technology and societal change, I do think that we need that societal change for us, but some of those technologies have tremendous uh, potential. I know a lot of my colleagues and a lot of commentators really think that direct air capture is, is for the birds, you know, but I actually think, you know, we are going to need some of it and some of the modeling that we have done to look at niche markets for direct air capture does show that it could scale quite quickly. Uh, it's a very granular technology like solar panels and wind turbines, so it would actually come down and cost very, very quickly. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we need some of those things. I would rather have those things and reduce the over shave off the overshoot uh, than not have Absolutely. those things yeah. uh, and allow for that overshoot and hope for, um, you know, uh, biogenic uh, uh, carbon sequestration. You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. One final thing to say on that maybe is, uh, you know, the reason why I don't want to see any of that overshoot is because of these irreversible transitions, these critical transitions. I mean, they're just so scary that do all the social stuff and also let's please try and avoid some of those uh, critical transitions across the, across the planet. Yeah, and this week has been a stark reminder on the cries for his stand where I go to get freaked out is the kind of when you start crossing into overshoot, you caught you with the ice sheets and things like that, you accelerate those melts and that's where we start to lose control. It's not said enough that the IPCC reports over time have done a fantastic job with average temperatures, really fantastic job, they're really very remarkably accurate, uh, but have systematically underestimated the temperature at which we can get these large scale transitions. So that's been coming down from uh, seven degrees in some of the first reports down to between 1.5 and 2 today for some of these different points, for some of these irreversible transitions, these large scale transitions. And we often concentrate on the tenth of a degree, and that, that really matters. Um, but we don't talk about how the distribution of energy changes under that temperature. And these changes are planetary in scale. Um, things, even, even things like sea level rise, I don't think it's commonly understood that even if we, we get to net zero, we're going to continue to have sea level rise for maybe something on the order of centuries, you know, uh, and under, under warmer trajectories uh, for millennia. Um, so this is not really getting across. I think people think about things in terms of 1.5 or 2 degrees. They don't think in terms of, you know, crop yield prices due to uh, changing weather patterns. Is this something you confront in your book? Is there food... You know, the, the food price index sort of sometimes correlates to conflicts and things like that. Is this something that's on your radar? I think it is. My biggest concern is in the, in the short term, uh, in the medium term, there are uh, food yield issues. Uh, so more and more papers are coming out. In the last few years, there's been a, a real rush of papers, and partly that's due to the modeling, uh, integrating some of the agricultural science with the climate science. And they're all showing quite sharp reductions uh, in yields and high uh, chances of multiple breadbasket failures. So failures in multiple areas where major crops are grown due to extreme weather events. Even by 2030, 2040, 2050, you know, and by 2030 the impacts might still be only on the order of a few percent, and by 2050 you're, you're getting into the tens of percent in terms of the yields that you productions. And these are serious impacts. Um, the, the chance of multi-breadbasket failure under uh, some of these uh, scenarios, under uh, two degrees, for example, uh, goes up uh, 40% uh, for maize uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, 20, so I can link to some of these papers. So there's a real flurry of activity here. 
and I find it very concerning and I find it that we're not really talking about it as enough as communicators because I think food is really where it hits people and because of the globally interconnected supply chains of food it's very efficient in a, in a sense but it's very precarious. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, we, we, we waste a whole lot of food, but when I mean efficient, I mean in terms of some of the production uh, processes, which are damaging in themselves in an environmental sense. Yeah, okay. So food, food is a big one in terms of what, that kind of first signals of human chaos. Yeah, I, so I see that as being the, the real signals of, of global impacts at the same time. Of course, we're having huge regional impacts already, um, but they tend, you know, they're popping up not all at the same time continuously. Then, um, whereas a, a food deal crisis would certainly take us into something like the uh, the food year, uh, food price spikes in the last uh, in the two thousands, you know, last uh, two thousand seven, where we had those food price uh, spikes around the world. And we saw the chaos around the world because of that. Uh, lots of conflicts around the world, lots of protests, lots of riots. Um, and we could start to see that again. Um, and I, I feel like I'm getting into the fear, the fear again, but I, I think th these medium-term impacts are important to spell out because people think about Greenland ice sheets or they think about um, you know, maybe currents in the ocean or things like that. But we've got to be talking about how it hits people on their, on their dining room table. Absolutely. And these are... These are triggers really for all kinds of problems. You know, yeah, conflict is one that springs to mind. But uh, yeah, these are things that we need to be anticipating. Yeah, and we we are um, we are betting on being able to increase these yields in the future as well. So we you know we've got this crisis also that uh, consumption is going up, meat consumption is going up in some areas of the world, um, and so we're also relying on a yield increase to actually keep us in. It, you know, keep us in with the with the food that we're already it was already putting too much pressure on. So yeah, um, yeah. so the, the, that reaches an, an obvious sort of intersection. Yeah, and and, and, and and so on the hopeful perspective of that, well, you know, plant-based diets are really just, I mean, we use 80% uh, uh, of global uh, land, ice-free land. Uh, about half of that is for um, agriculture, and 80% of that is for ag uh, animal agriculture. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if we do see these yield declines, well, what's the first thing that's going to go, hopefully, it's going to be uh, animal agriculture and we're still going to have the calories and proteins available to us uh, because we're not going to be eating animals anymore because they're just going to be very expensive. Yeah. So if we're being realistic, maybe what happens is globally, you see these food price uh, spikes, but you see a, a, a real uh, demand side shift uh, from animal agriculture to, to plant-based proteins. As long as the economic systems and the subsidies that are available to, to production uh, actually shift along with that. So that's actually a, a smart policy route in terms of agriculture for us all to sort of implement yeah absolutely i mean you couldn't really ask for a more damaging sector across multiple different areas of environmental crises as the animal agriculture biodiversity uh, microbial resistance uh, eutrophication of waterways uh, just ocean death um, not to mention the climate uh, you know emissions um, i recently edited a paper on um, an air pollution from uh, agriculture which is yeah. quite high um, so animal, animal agriculture so you could really ask for a, a, a sort of a worse sector across so many different dimensions interesting and um, okay well, just to, to finish on I, I want to ask you, um, you know, coming to Glasgow coming to any cop there's so much going on and there's just science politics you've got activism you've got energy you've got all the things that you're working on plus everything else um, what is there anything that you can identify as emergent from this that sort of struck you that's um, in, you know, impacting the way you think or reflected? So at least in some of the events that I've seen, it's been at, there's been uh, a lot more, a, a lot more younger people talking, a lot more younger people uh, getting to grips with uh, some of the terminology that's being used and misused. Uh, they're becoming quite savvy, I think, about the ways in which terms can be positive and also negative. So the nuance about that, things around net zero. I mean, is that a delaying tactic, is, or is that a scientific concept that you know we absolutely need? Um, things like uh, you know emissions taxes, um, uh, carbon markets, things like this. So that's been good to see that, that, that there's some nuanced thinking from the very young people talking about that. And, and the things that I, what I said yesterday at, at an event was, you know, if you are being talked to. Don't be put off by hierarchy and status. You know, if the young people are talking to business leaders or scientists or uh, politicians and they use a term, say what you mean by that term. 
You know, yeah. if you're if you're really excited about uh, decarbonizing, ask them what they mean by that. Do they mean their supply chain? Do they mean just their offices? What do, what do they mean? And I think partly that confidence you can see that coming across in, in some of the younger activists, which is great to see. Okay, brilliant. Um, and as you brought it up, net zero delaying tactic or scientific uh, mechanism? Well. Um, <laughs> both. <laughs> this is what I had to do. So, you know, yes, yes uh, both. Okay. Both. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick.